Okay, so we're going to move back a little bit <clears throat> to get a little running start. So this letter, the Alter Rebbe, is devoted to explaining that there is no distinction between what we refer to as Panemia Satira, which is the parts of Torah or the aspect or the perspective of Torah that deals with what's going on under the surface, and Chitzenius or the Nigla of Torah, the parts of Torah that deal with the things we can touch, feel, and measure. Sometimes we are tempted to sort of separate them out as if one deals with the spiritual and the other deals with the mechanical. And part of the Alter Rebbe's message in this, this uh, overarching message of all of Hasidus is that you can't separate the two. They're not distinctive. They're like the body and the soul. So again, we're going to start a few lines back. We started, we read this already last week, but get a little running start. It's the Chitas for the fifth of Cheshvin of a leap year. There might be a mistaken understanding from those who make just a cursory glance and now look very closely at this statement. Remember, the statement is based on a Pusik that's in the book of Daniel that's being read with a little bit of a different emphasis. The Pusik reads that the wise will shine like the bright sky and the righteous of the community like the stars forever and ever. And then we sort of reread this to say the scholars will shine not kizoyhar, like the brightness of the sky, but al yidei through the zoyhar. That is the study of zoyhar, which is a particular book, but it's representative of the whole genre of what we call Pneumius HaTeira, will bring this brightness into the world. <clears throat> now, sometimes there is a mistaken understanding that bifurcates the two into separate uh, uh, silos, as if they have no interface and no interconnection. So here he explains that those who misunderstand See this that the Lima de Isava Heter, the Seda Titus, Sumilena de Tevara Milvad, to Tevara, stop. <clears throat> that the study of what is permitted and what is prohibited, and what to do if you put chicken soup in the cereal bowl, and whether you're allowed to move that on Shabbos, and whether you have to return this particular lost item or you're allowed to keep it, and the laws of what makes a person tame if he brushed up against the grave or he came near it, and so on, that this is somehow only from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Everybody is familiar that in uh, uh, in Ganadin, there were two trees, the tr well, many trees, but two identified trees, the tree of good and evil and the tree of life. Adam and Chava ate from the tree of good and evil and were expelled from Ganadin and were prevented from returning lest they eat from the tree of life. That's the summary of the story in Beratius. The understanding of the tree of knowledge of good and evil is the intermixture between good and evil. So in the Garden of Eden, life was simpler, not easy, but simple. This is acceptable, this is unacceptable. Once you go outside the Garden of Eden, not only is it tempting, but it's unclear. We don't always know what's good and what's evil. Sometimes what's good presents itself as evil, and what's evil presents itself as good. So we have to uh, pull apart, discover the godliness that is trapped in the klipa. That is what we are doing when we encounter a lost item. We say, am I allowed to keep this? Am I obligated to return it? The uh, Whatever the halachic issue, I'm trying to decipher the good from the evil. Now, the tree of life appears to be purely of godliness, where there is none of this confusion. There isn't, isn't even the concept of expiration, which is the antithesis of the tree of life. So some wanted to make the mistake of thinking, okay, so that's how we, we line up Torah. There's the part of Torah that deals with extracting the godly from the ungodly. That is the analysis that results in our changed behavior. And then there's a whole other tree that's purely godliness. And the two are, again, using the imagery of a silo. So this is a tremendous mistake. Now, we are familiar already from all of our learning with two important terms that this touches upon, although it's not mentioned here explicitly, but perhaps it will give us another avenue to understand it. And they are the terms soivev and mamale. So again, you, we've encountered this many times. Sometimes it's also, we use the word makif and panimi. 
they're essentially interchangeable. Soivev is the way that the infinity of Hashem surrounds, that's what the word Soivev means, surrounds the entire world. So ultimately, there is no difference between anything in this world, because it is all subsumed within the infinity of Hashem. Mamale is how Hashem interacts specifically with the world and treats every aspect as it is personalized. <clears throat> now, sometimes it is seen that, again, these are two completely separate modes. Sometimes I'm in my Soivev mode. Sometimes I'm in my Mamale mode. So when the teacher says, well, if I make an exception for you, I'm going to have to make an exception for everybody. So I'm dealing only in the Soivev. I'm not dealing with you. I'm dealing with all of you. I'm dealing with Klal Yisrael, not Reb Yisrael. And sometimes when I'm dealing with this very specific person, I don't want to, it doesn't matter what the statistics are. So it only matters about this very specific particular person. And again, these two modes are commonly siloed, bifurcated, whatever image that's most meaningful, they're kept completely separate. This is a very common process. We put this away, now we pick up this. We act in this manner, now we act in that. One of the core messages of Hasidus is that Soiviv and Mamale absolutely interact together. What are some of the manifestations of this? If we purely act in the manner of Mamale, where we're being only focused on what is very particular, we run the risk of sort of denuding the neshama out of Torah, because we only see it as a bunch of laws on the operation of society, the functionality of business, or the ritual execution, and so on. But we lose the neshama because we're so fixated on the execution of the mechanics of the law that we lost the neshama. And we wind up essentially becoming almost like an academic analysis. This guy has a PhD in chemistry, and this guy has a PhD in Talmud. And we like suck the godliness out of it. And we look, go looking for godliness somewhere else. Or we go looking for godliness, and we're looking for godliness, and we can't be sort of handicapped, bothered, as we might call it, by all of the execution of the material things and when to stand up and sit down and lean to the left and not lean to the right. And we have this fear that they will be separated out. And this is how, again, within the world of Torah people, many people function in their service of Hashem. They see them as independent, separate character traits, never to be intertwined. This is a not uncommon phenomenon. Now, the Alter Rebbe is going to re rebut this idea. And as we are accustomed to, just like in the very beginning of Tanya, where we di disabuse the concept that a tzaddik is just a really good guy and a rush is like a horrible, wicked guy, or that tshuva is about fasting and self-mortification, or that God created the world once upon a time, and now the world is functioning the way we began, Shariqat Vamuna. So here again, the Alter Rebbe is really, and now you can sort of understand why people find Tanya and Chassidus Chabad to really be different than what they are accustomed to, even the people who are being in the most respectful manner, because it is a radically different way of seeing it. If we see the world, okay, now I'm studying Talmud, and now I'm dealing with the laws of property ownership, and now I stop that, and now I'm davening, and now I'm dealing with my relationship with Hashem, but the two are independent of each other, these pathways, you know, like we can fall into that uh, uh, um, pattern, and the Alter Rebbe is coming to say, no, it's the same infinity of Hashem in the Talmud even though it's dealing with very pragmatic laws and property ownership, et cetera, <clears throat> as it is in the study of the, quote, mystical, as it is often referred to. So the al said, Mavachu Pelagada. First of all, this itself would be rather stunning. Machmas um, Atzmi, prima facie. Vesesha Pashte Aksuvi, Mavdrashu Besenazal. First of all, we have a Pusik in Mishle that says explicitly, referring to all of Torah, that it is a tree of knowledge for those who hold steadfastly to her. So first of all, Torah itself does not distinguish about Torah. 
We don't find anywhere in Torah that Torah says, well, this part of Torah is different than every other part of Torah. In the Gemara, it's in the Gemara volume of Brachas, 32b, it says, what is the remedy for a person who is afflicted with illness? He should engage in Torah study. As it says, uh, desire fulfilled in the tree of life. That's the quote from Mishlei. And the tree of life is nothing other than Torah. As it says, it is a tree of life for those who hold steadfast to it and those who support it are joyous. So what we see is that this all of Torah, meaning if a person is eager to find his relationship with Hashem, let him go and study the laws of kosher, the laws of Shabbos and so on. Say, well, that doesn't feel very godly. It's sometimes very hard to find the godliness in that. And yet, our position is that that is where the infinity of Hashem is to be found. So again, we are not separating out the two. And then the Alter Rebbe continues. This reference that Torah is the tree of life, remember back from the story of the Garden of Eden, is not limited to the Zohar. It's not limited to the overtly spiritual things. It's not limited to the obviously spiritual things. There is a discussion, I think it's maybe in the Medrash or the Talmud, I'm sorry, I forget, where it asks, you know, what is the most important concept in Torah? And the arguments go from everywhere, from I am Hashem, your God, the creation. And the ultimate resolution is, it's the statement about the daily sacrifices. You know, it's about the routine, the ordinary, the repeated, the continuous. And we know this in life, you know, how does a person amass uh, wealth? putting away little bits of money. How does a person get physically healthy every day? You know, it's about the, the very routine. And can we find the infinite in the finite? Now we have truly uh, demonstrated the dear B'tach that, that God is welcome, even in the seemingly least welcome of spaces, the places where you would say, well, what did God want over there? But God wants to be everywhere in that entirety. And so there is no separation between the, quote, overtly spiritual parts of Torah and the very um, regimented parts of Torah. And especially since, as we know, that the Zayha was not commonly studied. So when they're making a reference that if a person wants to be connected with Hashem, if a person is feeling illness, they should attach themselves to Torah because Torah gives life. They're certainly not referring to the Zohar, because the Zohar was not commonly studied then. When you say, I mean, even to this day, when you say to your average, I'm talking about Torah-aware person, to study Torah, they're not studying the Zohar. So how could we suggest that Torah is the tree of life only because Torah means all of Torah? And that becomes the challenge to us. Can we find the Kedusha in the uh, in the study of Torah, even when the topic is not knock your uh, 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 grab your attentionly, obviously spiritual. Not only was it not commonly studied, it was hidden from people at that time. In that historical time, it was basically hidden from people. Except for some very special, rare people. So certainly, when they are recommending that a person should study Torah as a mechanism of bringing life, because again, it's talking about a direct connection. A person is ill. doesn't mean he has the sniffles, you know, God forbid. It means he's clinging to life. What's going to give him life to the tree of the, the study of Torah, which is the tree of life. It's not referring to Kabbalah because that was not the common study at that time. Because even then, when they studied, those who studied it didn't do it publicly. So there is not, it's not reasonable to assume that when the Talmud recommends that the person who was sick should go and study Torah, that he's talking about the Kabbalah. Because, and this is a reference to a Gemara, it's in the volume called Chagiga, page 13, the Gemara comments, until here you have permission to speak. From this point forward, do not have permission to speak. It is written in the book of Ben Sira. Seek not things concealed from you, nor search those hidden from you, reflect on that which is permitted to you, you have no business with secret matters. So we see that in the times of the Talmud, <clears throat> the study of Zohar was rare and private. So when the Talmud is saying that if a person is seeking life, the eighth Chaim, the tree of life, excuse me, they should, um, they should 
uh, study Torah, it is not talking about studying Kabbalah and studying the Zion. It's talking about studying, again, what we call Nigla, which is, includes the laws of Shabbos, the narratives, the history, <clears throat> et cetera, et cetera. And yet, how is that going to find me life? Again, it is often hard to see the godliness there, but this is our point. Now, we are familiar that one of the core um, uh, differences between the style of the study of what we call, again, nigla. Nigla means revealed. So we're, we're talking about things that we can see. I know what lost items are. I know what it means to return lost items. I know what Shabbos is. I know what it means when Shabbos starts. I know what cooking means. These are terms I'm comfortable with. I'm familiar. I can see them. As opposed to the more hidden concepts, we use the word mystical because it sounds much more exciting, but it means that which is not obvious. <clears throat> so when uh, 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 this, one of the core messages of Hasidus is that the two are an absolute union, like body and soul are an absolute union. You cannot separate them. And this is a common message that holiness is always about cooperation. A very simple illustration, which we probably mentioned before, the difference between soil and sand is that in soil, the grains cooperate. So the soil will give of its nutrients to support the plant. The plant supports the animal. The animal supports the person. The person serves Hashem. Hashem rejuvenates the soil, and you have cooperation. In the desert, all the grains of sand are individualized. And that's why nothing can grow in the desert, because the sand will not share its nutrients with anything else. Each grain is absolutely individualized. This is the concept of chesed and so on. So imagine that not only is there a cooperation between differing entities, but that they that, that we can evoke that they are all in the service of Hashem. The study of Talmud is in the service of Hashem, just like the study of the Zaya. The study of the mystical worlds and creations are, are aligning us with Hashem, just like studying the precise laws of how a mezuzah is written and the particular mechanisms of how kashras is to be observed. <clears throat> there is an absolute cooperation between them when we can focus on the infinity of Hashem to be found there, even though it doesn't always necessarily, so to speak, jump off the page. And this becomes the core, a, the core point of this letter, which is a core point of the whole teachings of Tanya, is that we should never see them as bifurcated. You know, there's a sarcastic saying that ever since rabbis became doctors, Judaism became sick. That is, we started to see Torah like an academic profession. You get a PhD in history, you get a PhD in Torah, but it sucks the neshama out of it. That this becomes another form of study, an arm's distance detached form of study. And that's not what we want. We want Torah to shape our character. How can the study of the laws of Shabbos shape my character? It shapes my behavior. How does it shape? Because again, I find the infinity of Hashem that is contained within it. In the parsha that details the majority of these types of laws, the laws of the practical uh, 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 execution of societal laws, which comes right after the, the parsha of the Ten Commandments called Mishpatim, it opens up when it says these are the Mishpatim, again, those laws which resonate with us intellectually, that we can appreciate, again, laws of how to treat employees and laws of contracts and laws of property damage. It says, Tasim Lifnehem, you have to place them within you to your very essence. What do you mean? This is a way uh, if I, uh, to, 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 again, execute a, a healthy society. No, 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 you're misunderstanding. This is Kedusha that you can absorb. I don't know what Atzilis is, I can imagine, but I know what it is when my neighbor's cow eats my tomato plants. I understand that. So I can personalize it and find the same degree of Kedusha contained within those experiences as contained within the uh, the, the intellectual awareness. So the, the Alter Rebbe goes on and he says, Because again, it was only the Arizal who said, and again, that's it was just as your uh two days ago, um, that said that it's become mandatory to make this public it wasn't public it wasn't commonly studied but again 
probably, hopefully we would say, because people were able to see the Kedusha in the study of Nigla. They were able to see the godliness in those uh, laws and so forth. And in large part, like the Altar Rebbe writes at the end of the Seif Shal Benanim, the fact that we can, uh, that Hashem is willing to compress himself into laws like that, that Hashem concerns himself and, and can express himself uh, overcoming his nature, kind of, if you can use that about Hashem, which you really can't, but we're borrowing that term of being infinite to embed himself in laws of returning lost items, et cetera, et cetera. This becomes a mechanism for us to respond and overcome our limitations and go from being essentially self-concerned to, to the infinite. Hashem's infinite squeezed into the finite. So at, there was a time when people appreciated that and more immediately. It's harder for us. So now we need to go right more to the sort of very essence of it. But that's a, that, that's a far more recent phenomena. That's not what the Talmud is talking about. So again, the Alter Rebbe is validating this concept. And again, this is a style that we are familiar with. You make a conceptual point. You can't just say, well, this is what I feel. You have to support it scholastically, like he supported the concept of Tzaddik Benini in Russia scholastically, the idea of Hashem is continuously creating the world scholastically, the concept that tshuva is not about self-mortification scholastically. So now we're supporting this idea scholastically, we can't just say, well, that's what it is. And we say, well, that's what I like. So here's evidence that clearly the Talmud says that if a person is clinging for life, they should study Torah and that they're not referring to Zohar. That means that contained within the nigla, the legal and so forth, you'll find the infinite of Hashem. And even Rabbi Shum Bayechoi, who authored the Zohar, also made the same point, that he only expre expressed this to his close inner circle. Then there's also a whole other logical disconnect to this idea. Meaning, this suggestion, this school of thought, that only that God can only be found in the Zohar, in the Kabbalistic, in the, and so on, and not at all in the Nigla. And again, this was a common issue. Take it, a, a 20th century illustration of this idea. A 20th century illustration of this idea, when the Jews came to this country and they were faced with the materialistic uh, seductions of America, some people said, you know, I don't find it meaningful, all these rituals and laws and so on. They found meaning in the, the mystical depths. So they said, well, then I'm going to discard the uh, the material and the pragmatic and the systematic and the and the, the rigid and so forth. I'm, I'm going to get rid of that because I don't find it meaningful at a spiritual level. What a chassid has come to tell us that if you understand the mystical, you'll find it in the ordinary. Meaning, if you connect yourself with Hashem, you'll find godliness in the ordinary activities of life and going to work and paying the bills and grocery shopping and banking and, and all of that stuff. As opposed to seeing it as bifurcate, I leave God in shul, I go out into the cold, dark world where I get abused and so on until I can come back and get rejuvenated. And to see that there is no separation between them. I don't live in two separate worlds. I'm serving Hashem in all of those circumstances. Now the Alter Rebbe brings a conceptual idea, I meaning not only that, again, this is an academic process. I raise an idea, the idea that godliness can be found directly in the legal side of Torah, and I now substantiate it from these quotes from the Gemara that says that if a person is clinging to life, he should study Torah, and clearly that is only a reference to, or is also a reference to, the legalities of Torah, as we have demonstrated, because the Zohar was not available, so on. Now, we bring you another illustration of this concept, not just to continuously beat on it, but because it, it adds another angle to it. We have a rule that um, if a person is engaged in Torah study, they are exempt from davening. Now, in our world, who are we kidding? You know, we take breaks, you know, we go out for lunch and so on. 
We can't say that all we do all day, even if you're in yeshiva, is study Torah. So it, uh, there could be a rare person like that, but that is not a common phrase. People have breaks, they have uh, uh, lunch breaks, they, they go for a walk, they go outside, and so on. So if you're going to take a break, you're going to take a break to daven as well. But conceptually, if a person was truly engaged in Torah study, and nothing else, he would not have to interrupt in order to uh, in order to daven. Now, how does this work? We, as we know, davening aligns us with the infinity of Hashem. It creates this Kabbalistic term called Yechudim El Yenim, which means that we are unified, we're one with Hashem. Must be that the davening takes that place. I'm sorry, that the Torah study takes that place, achieves the same objective. For example, we know that on certain holidays and special days and so on, we don't say tach. Why? Not because, woo no school today, but because the day itself achieves the objective. Or, as we had in the beginning of this year, when Rosh Hashanah falls on Shabbos, we don't blow the shofar. We don't uh, shake the lul of an esr. Why? Because it's not necessary. The, the day itself achieves that objective. And therefore, it becomes unnecessary. So when we say that a person who is learning Torah is exempt from davening, and again, this is more of a hypothetical than it is a practical, that must be because the Torah study is accomplishing, effectuating the same that the uh, that the davening would. Thus we see, again, this non-separation, that Torah study, even if I'm studying the laws of business, conduct, etc., where there's no overt godliness, and you might say that the, the U.S. system has created an identical um, uh, ruling and law and, and, and pattern, it is because the, that Torah study is accomplishing what is accomplished by the, uh, the davening, the Yechudim El Yenim, this spiritual experience. Even though it doesn't always feel all that spiritual when I'm... Um, Studying Torah and so on. Kedish begemar, like it says in the Gemara, the Rishim and Yochai v'chaved v'chol misha terasa umnasa imatzikin letfila fil kashes v'dini mamanes k'rav Yehuda dechula tanoi benezikin heavy. That Rabbi Shimon by Yochai and later mentions here Rabbi Yehuda that they were literally Torah was all they ever did, and again, that doesn't mean that that it was all they did besides take a nap and eat lunch. I mean, that is literally all they ever did. And again, as the Gemara says, that many people attempted to emulate this uh, activity of Rabbi Shimon Bayechai and failed. So this is the rarest of the rare, who literally all they do is study Torah. Yes, Cardi? I, I have a question, and, and I... It sounds kind of crazy, but it's not, I don't think. Okay. Let you say, keep saying study Torah. Okay, great. How can we do that? What level do we have to be doing? Do we do five minutes a day? What do we go study? Do we just go and look at the Hamish and read five pages? I mean, this whole idea, I mean, it's, it's wonderful. It makes sense, but I need a practical how-to because I can't okay. go study all day long, but... That's I correct. If you're doing what you're saying, how do I do that? Okay, excellent. So here's, I, I think that the message that the Alter Rebbe is conveying is not about the, the what that we study, but it's about the sort of mental approach as to study. So we ask ourselves, why do we study Torah? So there's different answers we could give. One we could give is, I have to know what to do. I have to keep Shabbos. So I got to study the rules of Shabbos. That's one. Okay. Two, right. it's fascinating. It's interesting. Three, I want to connect with my heritage. I want to connect with my people and so on. What the Alter Rebbe is adding here, or maybe saying as the baseline premise is, this is how I connect with Hashem. You recount, we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit later, that back in chapter five of the beginning of Tanya and the Sefer Shalbaninim, the Alter Rebbe makes the point that when we study Torah, we are becoming aligned with Hashem. Even if the case that we study about will never come to be. It will never be adjudicated. 
that this guy will make this argument and his opponent will make some other argument and the law will be whatever it is. Even if this never comes to be, when we study Torah, we are aligning ourselves with Hashem. And as the Alter Rebbe emphasized there, the greatest form of alignment is when I get to know the other person. I mean, if we work together on a project, we become aligned. If we're passengers on the same plane, we become aligned. We share a certain bond, a certain connection. Oh, those people are on our flight. Or whatever it may be. We have some sense of connection. I go to the grocery store, the cashier checks me out. We have some degree of alignment. The most intense form of alignment is when I truly try to understand the other person, not invasively, but because I want to be unified with them. And so the Alter Rebbe is laying out for us that when we study Torah, whether it's five minutes, five hours, or, or at every moment, we want to be in pursuit of seeing the infinity of Hashem in that Torah, even though we're talking about a law that seems to be so almost picayune and so integrated in this rule and exactly how you stir the coffee and say, and so on. Can we see the infinity of Hashem in that experience? I mean, the best example that I can think of is an interpersonal relationship when your friend, your spouse, your child, your parent tells you about their day. Now, there might be a sense, if this was a stranger, I wouldn't care what you did all day. Meaning, I don't care about your day, I care about you. Since I care about you, a mechanism to be bonded with you is to ask you to tell me about your day and what you're thinking and feeling. If you were a total stranger, it wouldn't be that interesting to me that you uh, played the violin. I don't like the violin, but I like you, so I'm interested in the violin because I'm interested in you. So this is the underpinning of this message of Torah study of Hasidus. That Torah study is the mechanism through which we can become most intensely aligned with the infinity of Hashem, even though the topic seems rather pedestrian, right, rather that ordinary. Makes sense, but w so what do I go one across? So the, the next section, time you what do I you open, the, go do? so the next time you're going to study Torah, you're going to say, "Why am I doing this? I'm doing this because I want to know God." So you know, I, they, they, I get I get all that, but I don't have a Torah at home. Do I well, you a, have a chumash. A you got it online. <laughs> We're doing oh, it now. Okay. Th that's what I'm saying. Where do I physically, where do I go? Where do well, I go? Anytime you study Torah, which should be in oh. every free moment you ever have, yeah. you should be thinking, why am I doing this? I'm doing this because I want to be bonded with Hashem. So, right, in essence, right. Yeah. you know, it's like your friend, you know, you see your friend. So how are you? What's going on? So I'm not, I, I really, I want to know you. So, of course, if they're going to talk about things that are incredibly boring, you know, that like they're talking about their industry so intensely, like people, they can't, they can't follow. So you look for the things that you're going to find a little bit more of a, a, a bond and a union with. So don't be deliberately difficult. But it means that we want to see the infinity of Hashem in every page of Torah and every law and every rule and every nuance. If we can accomplish that, we can be aligned with Hashem regardless of what the topic is. Right. Okay, thank you. It doesn't only have to be in the exciting parts, like much of life, right? Very little of life is the exciting parts. Most of life is about bringing the sacrifice every day, that kind of routine, repeated, not glamorous process, not exciting process. So here the Alter Rebbe is further underscoring this idea that even Rebbe Yehuda, who says explicitly that all of his Torah study was in the laws of torts, which again is like so ordinary. And yet, if he's studying what's the law, if this guy's ox scored this guy's cow and knocked over his kiwi stand and so on, can you find the infinity of Hashem? Otherwise, we run the risk of, like I'm saying, you know, it becomes an academic thing. It's like we become PhDs in godliness and we have no passion about it there is not there's nothing about the relationship with hashem it's just about the academics of it it's just about knowing so much about it so the altar ever continues and 
And nevertheless, even though his study was, again, all about the laws of torts and damages and all this kind of ticky-tack stuff, he would only daven every three days, not because he wasn't orthodox, <laughs> meaning because he was experiencing the union of the infinity of Hashem in that moment. And again, we've probably all seen this sometimes in other people, people who are extraordinarily passionate about art or music, and I'm not. And they're so enlivened by it. It's so uplifting. And I'm like, I don't get it. Okay, that's a nice picture. It's not It's not meaningful to me, but it's meaningful to them. And they become so aligned with it. So each person has to find that. And again, you don't have to go and find the most difficult thing. But the concept is that when we study Torah, even if what we're studying, and often most of what we're studying, is very pragmatic stuff about you know how to make tea on Shabbos and etc., we are able to discover the infinity of Hashem in those very ordinary circumstances. Like it says in the Gemara, That again, it, this discussion is held about whether a person has to interrupt even to recite the Shema, and whether they're studying Mishnah or if they're studying the Chumash and which parts of the Mishnah, the laws of far, uh, of agriculture or the laws of leaving over the grains and which grains and all that. And it's so dense. It's so incredibly dense and all the laws of the holidays and the sacrifices and and, and so on. Again, it's, it's dense. It seems like, well, this is what they do in the Cook County court system. They're also adjudicating who's liable if his ox knocks over the, uh, his uh, kiwi stand and so on. It's very difficult to find the uh, Hashem in the Gemara. So he said, "That's me, but I may have them become famous. The Mishnah Yishivcha v'Mikrashu Teres Moshe v'Adi Adifa Mikabala di Matanusa, but I may have the Sham v'Teresh Musaf who Malka d'Hani said Amam Lubish b'Zak Moshkos v'Arizal." And there he even himself he goes back and forth and he discusses about all of these ideas, whether we're talking about uh, the Mishnah, which is described as like the maidservant who helps develop what's in the Chumash, or the Chumash, which is Moshe's teacher, which is, again, what, what is Chumash about? It's a lot about stories and wars and failings and so on. And yet we're saying that the depth of infinity of Hashem is to be found there. I think we mentioned this last week in the Rambam in his 14 volumes of law. The first law, page one, chapter one, book one is the foundation of all foundations is to know God. So, wow, this is great. We're going to know God. And that's what he talks about in the first couple of chapters. And the, the last chapter of the last book, of the last line, he talks about when Mashiach comes, the world will be filled with the knowledge of God. But in between, it's a lot of laws about potter wheels and about what to do if you drop the bean and next to a, a plant that's a great plant, but what kind of plant it is and whether it can be planted next to the other plant. You're like, what, what, what happened here? I thought we're learning God. I thought I'm going to know God. You tricked me. You know, you lured me in with all the exciting stuff. And now I'm deep in the weeds of understanding all these laws of agriculture and animal biology. What am I talking about here? And the point is, no, that is the infinity of Hashem to be found in all of those didactic rules and laws. That is Eitz Chaim, the tree of life, just like when we're going to sit down and we're just going to talk about the infinity of Hashem. And again, you think about this in interpersonal relationships, it's to be found in the common, routine, repeated, pretty much ordinary stuff. What do you do most of the time? Not all that much that's exciting. <laughs> you know, Most of life is pretty routine, but we're going to find the infinity, not despite that, in that. This is the key point, and that's when you have Sevev and Mamale coming together. That's when you find the infinity of Hashem to be found in the, quote, routine, ordinary, repeated, boring, whatever you're going to term we're going to use, we're going to find the infinity of Hashem contained within that activity. And now the Alter Rebbe doubles down. 
Not only is this true when we study the Talmud, but even in what is called the pilpul. Now, just a little uh, lingo here. The word pilpul, it actually means a pepper, but it's the idea of these very didactic and really deeply intertwined conversations and questions. So that means not only what's in the canon of scripture and Talmud, but even the, the, the ordinary discussions that are going on between the student and the teacher, where they're often arguing. And a lot of times the original suggestion is negated. And yet we can find the godliness there, meaning even in the minority opinion or even in a rejected and refuted opinion, we are able to find the infinity of Hashem contained within that uh, uh, experience. Like we find with uh, Rabbi Shem Boyachoy, that in the pilpul and the questions and the answers, which again would seem to come from the side of Rab, where godliness is hidden. And it's a challenge to the, to the essential point. Yet we can find the infinity of Hashem contained within these experiences. And here, the Alter Rebbe expresses the idea in a Kabbalistic term that it comes from the foundational point called the father, which remember the father is the initial idea, the idea that the man brings home the wheat and the wife turns the wheat into bread, or in the description of uh, the process of creation of life. So it comes from this level of Chachma, and it becomes embedded into Zah. But along the way, there's lots of questions, and th this becomes clear in the Talmud. Often in the Talmud, it will uh, present a dispute, and sometimes it even will come to an absolute conclusion, meaning often it's, we end up, there's two opinions, and then we have to make a decision. But we say, look, the words of Hillel and the words of Shammai are both Torah, they're both from Hashem, and we made a decision like Hillel. Sometimes, it's a little more rare, that we actually absolutely refute an opinion. We say, no, that opinion has been refuted. So this raises the question, so why is it still in the Talmud? Meaning, they went and they debated it and so on, and it was absolutely refuted, and sometimes even the person who presented it uh, renounces it, so why, why include it? Why should it even be there? It's clearly, quote, wrong, because the infinity of Hashem is still to be found within it. And therefore, even if I spent the whole hour studying a, an opinion which is ultimately refuted, I didn't waste my time. I have found the infinity in the process, not just getting to, well, what's the answer? Can I eat the challenge or not eat the challenge? It's not just about, quote, what's the answer? It's about discovering it there. And this became evident in the story of Rabbi Shum Boyechoi. This is, you know, associated with the Lagmoimer story, where he had to hide in the cave. That he says that because of the tsar, because of that suffering, that he was hiding in this cave for 12 years, he came out with a greater understanding of godliness. I'm uh, sorry, greater understanding of Torah. How is that? How does what how does that get? Because he became aligned with the infinity of Hashem. And again, finding the godliness there. And that was manifest by, before he went into the cave, he always asked questions of Rabbi Pinchas ben Yair, who gave him 12 answers, meaning 12 different ways to understand it. After the experience in the cave, Rabbi Pinchas ben Yair would ask him questions, and he had 24 ways of explaining it post facto. Now, it doesn't say this here, and this, what I'm about to share with you now, is just sort of my own idea. I have met the, some people in my life who basically know everything. You say, how could this guy know everything? He knows Torah, he knows Talmud, he knows Zohar. You know. How is that possible? How do these people, <clears throat> I mean, how much can you study and retain? More, you know, I can run a, a, a mile in 12 minutes, a guy runs a mile in four minutes. Okay, I understand the concept. But this seems, so this is my theory. My theory is, that it's not just that they happen to be very, very smart and have photographic memories, that too, and they're very disciplined, that too. But they touch the infinity of Hashem, and therefore they see it all that way. Again, I made this up. Maybe it's helpful to understand this idea. There is a story that is told. It's a common story that they like to tell in the yeshiva. It's a little bit of a long story, but I'll do my best. Feel free to uh, yank me back onto topic. There was a great sage. He lived in the early 1800s. His name was Rabbi Akiva Eger. And even though he lived in our world relatively recently, 
his commentary is held in a regard that's comparable to like Rashi and so on. And he was traveling through some town, I don't know, in Poland somewhere. And of course, they were so honored to have this special guest. And they gave him the best accommodations they possibly could. And after he was settled, he said, okay, do you have any books here? Do you have any svarim? They said, Rebbe, you know, we're simple people. We have a shul. We have some chumashim, a sedurim. We don't have a library. Nothing. We got one book that's been here. Can I study it? Sure. So they dispatch some kid. He goes and he brings the book. What is the book? The book is a commentary on the Talmud. It's not even the original Talmud. It's a commentary. It's written by a great sage who was known as uh, the Rashba, Man Shlomo Ben Yideret. Okay, so Rabbi Akiva Eger is happy. He goes into his room, and sometime later he comes out and he says to his host, The page is missing. He says, Rabbi, what should I <laughs> So he says, Okay, give me a pen and paper and I'll write it down for you. So they love to tell this story in yeshiva because you say, Well, if you knew it by heart, why? Of course, you have to review, and that's, that's true. But then there's another level of understanding. This level of understanding, I give to tribute to my late father-in-law, he said, maybe Rabbi Akiva Ega never learned this before. So how, because when he learned it, he ceased to be Rabbi Akiva Ega, and he became the Rashba. He totally, as we would use the term, was mavatal himself, total bittal. He became, and just like, I don't have to know what I'm going to say. It just flows naturally. He, it could flow naturally through him what the Rashba would have said for the next two pages. Can we get to that level of union with the infinity of Hashem so that we see the infinity of Hashem in the laws of returning lost items, in the laws of whether I can eat the chalant on Shabbos, in the laws of whether this is muksa, tamay, tahar, kachim, the agricultural mixture of seeds of plants I never even heard of. Can we touch the infinity of Hashem to be found in that level? And our answer is yes. And through the engagement of the physicist, meaning it's not despite the fact that it's dealing with material things. It's deliberately or it's it's, it's particularly because we are we are interacting with these types of material issues. And again, back to that story of Rabbi Shimon Yechai, where he described that having been through that experience, it didn't not it not only it didn't d- diminish his relationship with Hashem, it enhanced his relationship with Hashem. And what did they study? They must have studied the Mishnah, um, Tafre Sidre Shahai BMA, and the six hundred orders of Mishnah that they had at Rabbeinu Akadosh until uh, Rabbeinu Akadosh, which is uh, uh, Rabbi Yudah Nasi. Because if they were just saying the Zayar. It wouldn't have taken them 12 and ultimately a 13th year. So they're studying Mishnah. So what are they doing there? They're studying the laws of commerce and uh, government and so on. And we have another statement to uh, affirm this idea that we're told that once the Beis HaMikdash was destroyed, where can you find Hashem? You used to be able to go to the Beis HaMikdash. Now where do you find Hashem? You find Him in the strictures of rules, the laws of halacha. Well, yesh lafia, half of a fella, another fantastic idea, uh, meaning another reason why this has to be. And Alter Rebbe uses three terms here. He says, lahaflia, to be wondered, hafla of a fella, wonder of wonders, meaning how could you suggest otherwise? It absolutely has to be that way. Because how can somebody consider any part of Torah as not being part of the tree of life. That would contradict the Pusik that we brought before from Mishlei. And again, we see that it was used like davening. It brought the union just like davening. And finally, this idea here that if we only see these rules as sort of, I'm use this phrase, busy work, that while we're here in this world where we don't see godliness, so we have a tendency to misbehave. So God said, here's a bunch of rules so you guys don't kill each other. If that's all we saw, it, so then eventually we sort of take the training wheels off. We say, okay, you've proven yourself. Now come with us down to the basement and we'll show you the real stuff. That is, when Mashiach comes, well, we don't have to deal with all of this stuff anymore. If that was the whole, if that was its purpose, just to sort of uh, busy work and, and, and bide our time and, and modify our character, until we we got there, 
Eich yishka to our carbonus. Then how are we going to uh, uh, do the carbonus and, and know all these laws of Isser, Heter? Most of the laws are only relevant in the times of Mashiach. The Gamchulin, or, or, or just to slaughter animals for, for regular food. Im lo yod hilchus drisa v'chelda v'shiya ha'pois mashrit. If we're not familiar with all the nuanced laws that are associated with shrita, that you're not allowed to drag the knife, you're not allowed to poke the knife, whatever it is, all of these different nuanced laws that are going to become that much more uh, relevant when we're engaged with the Beis HaMikdash. We'll begin as Hasakin and the invalidation of a knife. Will a person just intuitively know how to do that? How to be a shaykhet? And you're suggesting that the knife will never get chipped or, or nicked? I mean, come on. All these laws about the fats and the blood. And to know all the laws are associated with whether a person becomes disqualified because they come in contact with the dead. Like the Pasuk says, a person will die at 100, that will be considered very young, but there's still going to be death. And if there's going to be death, we've got to know all the laws. So if, again, we see Torah as, as just a bunch of rules for how to behave ourselves, then... Why would we need them when Mashiach comes? Well, because they are the avenue for us to be aligned with the infinity of Hashem. It's not just some made-up thing that God just pretends, you know, here's a run laps or or here's some behavior modifiers. You have to know the laws that are associated with a woman who gives birth. That they'll become pregnant and give birth right away. She's going to have children every day. Whatever it is, there's still going to be functioning humanity. The rules are not going to change. So here you see how the Alter Rebbe is responding so abundantly to this understanding. And he says it's unnecessary to continue talking about this. It's clear in Talmud. Again, The point the Alter Rebbe is getting to, the core essence is, there is no separation between God and godliness and law. It is all one and the same. And this is probably the biggest challenge of whatever it is, whatever it began, I guess, in the Alter Rebbe's times, that it's very hard to see God in all of the things that we're doing. You know, a classic example, a person wants to see God, going to come study Torah. They open up the Talmud. They talk about people quarreling over the ownership of property or how to make challenge and so on. And they're like itching for something so much more spiritual. Again, we know this is in part what leads, sadly, Jews to, to think that spirituality is found somewhere else. It's found in meditation. It's found in uh, isolation. We don't see it as being found in the study of Talmud or the study of, uh, of Chumash. Because we're looking for something that's a little more bedazzling, that's going to jump off the page and go, wow. And al Rebbe is saying, you can find it there. Don't separate out the two. Don't treat Torah like it's somehow uh, neutered. It's, it's, it's some sort of cold academic study from some other life experience. That's great, but none of us, I don't think, study Talmud. We don't. We don't. We don't have classes in that. We, especially us coming in late and as an adult life, where do we find? Where do we? Where do we find godly? In any aspect of Torah, whether you're studying Chumash, you're studying Halacha, you're studying about the laws of you know making cholent on Shabbos and and so on. What we always have to be cognizant of, which is hard because we get so lost in the weeds of all of the rules. We got to remember this is the infinity of Hashem. You know, it's that classic story about one guy, you know, people are building a house. One guy, what are you doing? I'm doing my job. I'm build this guy. I'm laying bricks. This guy, I'm building a house for Hashem. You know, we know this in our interactions with other people. We can get so busy making lunch for our kids that we forgot that we're to love our kids. But we have to re recognize, we see, can we see the love of Hashem in these very ordinary experiences? It, I would love often, to do that. 
I'm sorry. What? I would love to, I, I would love to see Hashem in everything I do, but where do I find the rules of making a cholent? I didn't even know there were rules to make cholent. <laughs> well, that's, we, we got a, libraries upon libraries of books about how we, about cooking on Shabbos and not cooking on Shabbos and, and so on and so forth. So when we're thinking about, am I allowed to do this on Shabbos? Am I not allowed to do this on Shabbos? What we always have to remember is, is this what will God wants? Or am I just thinking about the laws of uh, of chemistry for the cooking process? So do I see God as the greatest advisor for life, or do I see life as the play illustration for the infinity of Hashem? Am I seeing the infinity of God as I study all the rules and laws and so forth? Again, in, the, in a sense, it's more obvious when I'm studying the conceptual ideas, or I'm even studying the stories. Hopefully it's easier to see God there. Sometimes it can be hard to see God there too. Can I also see God, continuously see God, in the rules and laws and then stand up, sit down, and eat this and don't eat that? So when we study all of Torah, we never separate out and say, okay, this is my PhD. I'm in Torah, this is some academic idea. So the author Rebbe continues, as we find, the Gemara often asks, well, when Mashiach comes, we'll figure it out. That means that it's not like, okay, Mashiach is here, I have to do this anymore. You know, we have to stop with this. Let's just worry about now, okay, because we, you know, it's the training wheels. But now we're out of school and now we don't have to do this anymore. No, this is, it's the same. And again, all of these different references that when Mashiach will come, then we're gonna we're gonna have clarity and insight. What does it mean that the scholars will no longer be dependent on the masses? Now, again, we're not just talking about financial dependence, but that's the way it's illustrated. Again, do we see it's, it's I mean, maybe this is the a simplest way to summarize it. Do I say that being Jewish is very important to me or that it is me? I mean, there's me, and this is important to me, but it's me. And therefore, it's a big part of my life, 60%, 80%, 90%, or it is my existence and identity. So again, we're using a pragmatic illustration to illustrate a conceptual idea. Now, the scholars rely on the ordinary people. And sometimes the ordinary people say, well, I have the money, I have all of the authority. And therefore, you have to com conform to my instructions. You want my money, you have to conform to my instructions. That is a certain attitude that exists. Now, in the times of the Second Beit Migdash, it didn't exist that way. Now, we're not here just talking about supporting or not supporting and the material and Yusachar and Zvulim. That's not the subject matter. The subject matter is, does the Gashmias support the Ruchnias or does the Ruchnias enliven the Gashmias? That's what it comes down to. Like we say, eat to daven, daven to eat. Does do material things support the godliness and become the avenue to the godliness, or is godliness here to make the ruchnius better? Do I have Shabbos so that I'll be rested up to be more productive during the week, or am I productive during the week in order to serve Shabbos? Does my body uh, serve my soul, or absolutely both in union, or my soul serves my body? This is the sort of conundrum that that uh, we are addressing here. Does the physical serve the spiritual, or the spiritual serve the physical? Physical serve the spiritual, the spiritual serve the physical. And the point that the author is making, by through the the entry point of the Torah study, is that we don't separate the two out. They're not separated out. They're absolutely one. The infinity of Hashem is found in the rules of Torah, even though those rules don't often announce themselves as being so spiritual. And they seem pretty ordinary and kind of borderline boring. And yet, that's where the infinity of Hashem can be found. All right, we'll stop here.